Ladies and gentlemen, you've heard their point. Now, hear the counterpoint on Libertarian Counterpoint Podcasts. Well, good afternoon and welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. Uh, The date is April 30th of 2020, and uh, we're coming to you from the middle of the coronavirus, uh, all that that entails. Uh, My name is Jason McPhee, and I will be your host today. And uh, with me, I have uh, on the left of your screen, I have Tim Ebert, and he is a libertarian uh, pilot in the state of California, our screaming eagle of freedom. <laughs> and and uh, <laughs> we have uh, on the other side of the screen, we have uh, Leon Brathwaite, and he is uh, a retired engineer at the state of California, and he is also an author, and he uh, had not too long ago published a book, uh, Bearing False Witness. Uh, Leon, did you want to tell us about the book real quick? Yes, as you, thank you, Jason. As as I said, the, the name of, of the book is is Bearing False Witness, and it's really a review of Christian history and Christian theology. I was a raised Roman Catholic, and I've always had some problems with the teaching of the church. So what I did was uh, go back into the Bible and look at some of the basic tenets of the teachings, and that book is about the resolution of my differences and my difficulties with some of the teachings in the church. One of the biggest issues in the book is about whether Jesus Christ actually died on the cross for us. I think that's a very, very big issue, and this is, this is thoroughly explored in the book. So please, if you want to find it, it's on Amazon. Type in my name, and it will pop up. Okay, great, man. That sounds interesting. And So I guess, uh, you know, uh, given that uh, a little bit on the theme of the book, I guess you probably have some concerns with the direction of the state as well <laughs> now in these days with COVID-19. Without a doubt. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, at first there's a rare bit of news I wanted to talk about that wasn't uh, directly related to COVID. We've just been talking COVID nonstop, but the presidential election is still, you know, uh, a bit of news and it's still, you know, progressing. And one of the issues that's come forward lately is that, uh, uh, you know, the Democrats have sort of settled on Biden uh, they've gotten a lot of uh, the endorsements started rolling out. Uh, even Obama finally gave his endorsement to Biden after seemingly an eternity. <laughs> yes, to do yes, that. yes. Uh, but uh, now, uh, over the last week or so, there's been allegations of uh, Me Too allegations against Biden as well. And so uh, essentially a staffer had come forward, a prior staffer, and claimed that uh, he had... Uh, um, yeah, but it sounds almost like a sexual assault, although, you know, not quite, you know, rape, but it does sound like a little bit of a sexual assault. And, and it's just, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, similar to uh, the Bill Clinton era, when the charges come up, uh, depending upon the, you know, political tribe, uh, uh, people change their views <laughs> real quick. Yeah. On this. Although yeah. I got to admit, uh, you know, for the most part, conservatives haven't sounded too uh, they've been pretty consistent, but uh, the, at least uh, Team Blue, the, the Democrats now suddenly seem to be saying, well, now we, we, you know, we need to listen to all men and <laughs> not necessarily. Yeah, listen no, to no, 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 no. Well, I'm just curious what you guys Good think. Point. Yeah. yeah, Leon, you seem to be raring to go, so uh, why, why don't you uh, give us your, your take on it? You know, since, since this allegation against Joe Biden came out from a woman by the name of Tara Reid, the only thing I can say about the Democrats is that there's a stench of hypocrisy that's emanating from them, and it's nauseating. And the reason why I say that is to look at how the Democrats treated Brent Kavanaugh. Christy, Christy Blasey Ford, Christine Blasey Ford was the name of the woman who accused him of sexual assault, and she had nothing. And to this day, she has not provided one single bit of proof that Brent Kavanaugh ever did anything to her. Not a single bit of proof. She couldn't tell us where it happened. She couldn't tell us when it happened. She couldn't tell us anything about it. And despite all that, she was very credible. (laughs) Yes, besides all that, yes, she was credible. Yes, that's true. (laughs) But now, uh, we had some prominent senators on the uh, Democrats. In particular, I I could think about uh, Kirsten um, Gillibrand from New York. She's a junior senator who was actually saying that this man is guilty until he proves his innocence. 
And this is the kind of thing that was going on during the Kavanaugh hearings. Now we have Joe Biden being accused of something far more serious. We have actual evidence that something did happen. We know where it happened. We know when it happened. We have someone who told friends contemporaneously about that. We have all of that. But now the Democrats are telling us now, oh, we need due process. We need to think about this very carefully. And some of these people are saying, we have to stand with Joe because Joe have always been good with women, with women issues. You know, it reminds me of some people who say, I have a black friend when they're accused of racism. It's the same kind of nonsense we are seeing now. And this is nothing but hypocrisy. These people have taken sexual assault and rape, which is a very serious issue in our society, have taken it and weaponized it for political purposes. Well, one of the, oh, hey, Tim, Tim, did you want to jump in? Uh, how could I follow that? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like I, I'm just going to stand back over here because I cannot touch that with a 10 foot pole. That was brilliant. No, I mean, you know, what, what more could, could be said about it that Leon has not said already? Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, one of the things I, I guess I wanted to add a little bit to is that it, it's kind of odd because I haven't even heard Joe Biden address the issue, which is kind yeah, of weird not. that, you know, when, when all of this came forward with Brett Kavanaugh, as you mentioned, I mean, immediately he had to come forward and address the issue because the right. media was uh, asking him about this and wanting to hold up his appointment at the drop of a hat, whereas... Yes. Well, Biden hasn't even been confronted with the issue, it seems like. Uh, I, I, have you guys heard anything different? I haven't heard him even address it. Since, since this allegation came forward, I mean, the woman, about a year ago, the woman did say that there was, you know, um, Biden had some issue of blah, 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 that kind of stuff. But she didn't, she didn't give all the details. But in the last month, month and a half, since she came out and gave the details, actually she gave it to a, to a left-wing a left wing. Uh, podcaster or something like that. Since she came out, Joe Biden have been on national TV, I think, three or four times. Not one of the reporters have asked him about the issue. I mean, forget about him addressing it. I'm talking about reporters who are supposed to be objective. They have not asked him about it. Not even once. So yet, but you're right, Jason. He have not addressed the issue at all. Not yet. And, and to be fair to to Biden as well. I mean, at this point, these are allegations. However, right. they sure. they're, they're much more there's much more credibility credibility to these allegations than than what we heard with uh, Christine Blasey Ford. Yes. When Christine Blasey Ford came forward. It was not only did she, as you mentioned, not recall all of the details that you know the, you would think would be extraordinarily important in impugning somebody's character, but yeah. Yeah, it, even when she called upon a uh, friend's re recollection of it, and then the friend came forward and said she didn't recall it's happening. Exactly. Exactly. Well, I mean, if, if that doesn't, you know, uh, deflect somebody's credible story, I don't know what does. Uh, but uh, certainly with this Biden case, there's a lot of, of credible side issues. For instance, there was the Larry King show where apparently the mother called in, and they have that. Uh, right. her saying that this happened to her daughter. She wouldn't give the specific details, but it happened right, right at that point. And there's neighbors that have also come forward, uh, I guess, and corroborated that the story was told to them at the time it, it occurred, apparently happened. So uh, kind, kind of a long time for somebody to sit on something like this, especially the fact that she's a registered Democrat as well. Course, and I think yeah. that's the, the, the reason that she says she didn't want to come forward is because she didn't, in the past, she didn't really want to, um, you know, impugn his character back then, I guess. I, I don't know. Actually, the, the, the mother on the Larry King, when she called into the Larry King show, said that um, the, the daughter didn't want, did not want to say anything out of respect, out of respect for the prominent senator. That's how she referred to Biden. She did not call him, she did not call him by name. But she did say that she didn't want to come forward because out of respect for, for, for him. So, but the point, the fact of the matter is that there's credible reason to believe something did occur. Yeah. So. Well, uh, I guess we've, uh, we've we've kind of beaten this horse to death. I suppose we'll hear more uh, details uh, as the weeks unfold. But at this point, uh, sure. it, you know, they seem to be going forward, and 
um, you know, and Me Too is apparently uh, uh, not that interested in this case at the moment. Uh, so anyway, like going on to well, no, uh, before before we leave this issue, I wouldn't completely say the Me Too is not um is is not interested in the case. There's one woman um um she's an actress McGovern Rose, Rose McGowan. McGowan or something like that. Yeah, she was she was one of the victims of um of Harvey Weinstein. She yeah. she is strongly in in Tara Tara Reed's uh, corner, and um, okay. she at least she was shaming um Alyssa. Another, another actress, Alyssa uh, Miller, and she used to be on one of those Who's the Boss or something like that. Yeah. She, she have really come out strongly in, um, in, in Tara Reid's uh, uh, favor. Uh, yeah, that was uh, uh, Alyssa Milano was, was the other actress. Um, yes. Yeah, and I, I, I found that, uh, you know, it's funny, you know, whether or not you take the, the uh, idea that, you know, believe all women all the time or if you say well let's let's hear the evidence and at least there's some intellectual consistency going one way or another with rose mcgowan and the people who yes. are the members of kavanaugh who say hey let's let's wait and hear the evidence on joe as well but right. to sit there and just flip because it's your you know it's your political advantage doesn't doesn't show a whole lot of character <laughs> indeed 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 oh, yeah <laughs> okay well thank you that is very oh, oh, sorry. It, it's very consistent <laughs> it's whoever your guy is that's the one you normally defend unless you're True. a libertarian then we hate everybody so <laughs> we're skeptical of all of them <laughs> yeah exactly yeah. Everybody's, everybody in politics is guilty until proven innocent if you're libertarian <laughs> so i guess when um Later on in the show, I guess we'll be talking about well, what does it mean to be a libertarian. I guess that that will be one of the characteristics. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Highly skeptical of politicians. Yes. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, speaking of which, let's let's move along back to the uh, COVID realm again. It's a little hard to escape that, but you know there has been some good news lately. Yes, and uh, um, you know there's a. Good news on a couple of fronts. One, there's been some antibody testing that's been going on a, about a week yes. or two ago. Uh, Stanford came out with the test that they had done in Santa Clara County, and then that was followed by a test by USC in Los Angeles County. And I believe there's also been some testing in New York and Florida as well since, and I guess probably happening all over the place at this point. But essentially this antibody testing is to find out a, a sample the population to find out how many have been exposed to this just so we can get a more accurate gauge of the death rate and if is the uh, response appropriate essentially the public policy response of saying hey shut everything down and so uh, anyways it, it's been looking much closer like the the numbers that they had previously looked at and just uh, having that skewed sample of people who come in and represent it that the hospitals is sick and then being in the emergency room on death's bed, that was about, I think around 5% before, but now we're down much closer to 0.1%. Uh, I think the New York number was closer to 0.5% of the population, but either way, we're getting much closer to levels that are closer to what you might expect of the flu or something, you know, a little more aggressive than the flu. Uh, and, and either way, it's, 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 indicates it should be a much different public policy consideration. So there's there's uh, uh, that news. And I guess, uh, you, do you guys have any thoughts on that before we move on to the other good news? Uh, well, my, I think my only uh, thought would be to refer uh, people interested into some of the articles from FEE, Foundation for Economic <coughs> Education, uh, Cato, and uh, l listen to Tom Woods on these subjects uh, for a little bit broader perspective on on all this. And uh, I, th I think those are good sources of of uh, information, uh, you know, about uh, about those types of things going on. So I don't know. Just so that's all I have to say. If that's worth much, but. Yeah, I, I would I would add I would add that these models that are being used to determine death and determine rates of infection, I mean they were totally wrong, and these models were used to guide government policy. The economy have been shut down as a result of these models. People's lives have been ruined because of these models, and now we are finding out. Look at that, what happened in New York. 
They are telling us that there are a lot more people who are infected, which will mean the death rate is a lot lower when you look, when you when you um, do the um, when you do the, the calculations. And this is the problem with government overreaching of just saying let's shut everything down. We're going to designate certain things as essential, and we're going to leave those open, and everybody else have to shut down. Why they? Why take for instance Costco? I would say Costco was designated as a, because it's a it sells food, it was designated as essential. So we left Costco open. But yet, you know what Costco did? They figured out how to manage transmission. Okay, I go to Costco and you know I've never heard of anybody getting infected because they went to Costco. But the other people whose lives have been ruined, their livelihood, that's essential too. So these models have been used to ruin people's lives. And now <laughs> we're gonna say, well, you know, sorry, sorry, we, we can't we were a little bit wrong. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You know, I, I I agree with you, Liam. But one of the uh, things that I I noticed just from the beginning of this is that uh, you know there tends to be this this uh, gravitas, I guess, that that doctors and scientists are having at the beginning of all this, and 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 yeah. rightly so as far as their field is concerned. But this is not simply a medical or or science issue. This is also an economic issue. And I didn't right. hear any sort of consideration of saying, okay, well, let's hear what the economists have to say about this at the beginning of the sure. process as yeah. well. Because once you yeah. start moving huge sections of the economy around, you're you're really in the realm of economists. And to, to just shut them out of the you know, the whole equation uh, and just say, okay, well, what are the what, what does Dr. Fauci say? What does you know what does this doctor say? You know, they, their job is to fight the disease. And, and it's a pretty narrow focus. It's not about making sure everybody has jobs afterwards. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we exactly, really exactly. need it. It's yeah. one of those things where scientists and doctors really need to be working hand in hand at this. And it's, it, I'm just kind of shocked at how it was such a narrow minded process as, as we went forward with this, uh, that, that you really didn't hear much consideration on the economic uh, sure. aspects. Sure. So, no, I mean clearly, clearly we had to do take precautions, and clearly we had to manage the transmissions. Clearly, those things had to be done. There's no doubt about that. But to shut down the economy, seriously? I mean, come on. If 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 Costco and and Walgreens and all these other places that I go to could figure out how to manage transmissions, I think everybody else could have done the same thing. Maybe there might have been some people who might have decided, like for instance, my son has a has a friend who runs a bar. And maybe social distancing is probably impossible in a bar, right? So maybe he would have had to shut down, but it that would have been an economic reason for him shutting down, not because it was mandated by the government. Yeah. But but overall, I think most every business that have shut down could have figured out some way to keep operating, maybe not at full capacity, but to keep operating without having to shut down in this dramatic way that we have seen since this COVID became such a, a real life thing in our lives. Probably even a barber, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully that'll help us get our heads on straight in a few weeks. Yeah. <laughs> Probably be looking like ZZ Tops in <laughs> about a month. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm wearing this long hair as a form of protest for my barber. Uh, I, you know, so the, the fuzzier I look, the the more people will realize, you know, hey, how long this has gone on and it's it's uh, time to bring the barbers back uh, sure, into the sure. loop. <laughs> well, you know, it's it's funny too, uh, you know, speaking of some of uh, I guess I'll, I'll get to the other good news in just a second, but uh, as, as far as the, the cost, because that's kind of what you're talking about in this, you know, sort of central planning strategy where we've just yeah. jumped in and locked everything down. Some of the costs are starting to become visible to a lot of people, and I mean, one we're we're over thirty million jobs lost in a period of about five to six weeks. At least there's thirty million uh, claims for unemployment have come, right. so that's yeah. about a fifth of the workforce almost in the United yeah. States, and that's just this country alone. And uh, a few of the other uh, issues, uh, the you know, the UN put a report out not too long ago saying that that there's issues with the food chain as well. And, um, 
Yeah, I'm not sure what that was about. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, was I, I think that was uh, Jay, uh, James experimenting with his. Uh, yeah, for, for for the next show. <laughs> for, the, for the next part, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, but uh, you know, one of the other uh, issues was with the uh, United Nations, and they had put out a report saying that you know because of interruptions in the food chain, because of you know shut down the economies. We're talking, they're predicting that hundreds of thousands of kids will die in, in impoverished yeah. areas of the world because of this, um, you know, and, and, and many, many more will be put at a lot of uh, risks related to poverty as well. So, I mean, you know, here we have this story of the world pulling itself out of poverty and now through our yeah. centrally planned edict, we're, <laughs> we're, we're blazing a trail back, I guess, as we burn everything down. And, and then uh, you, you get one other story too, I figured I'd throw in there as well is, uh, you know, part of the issue was uh, business bailouts to try and get, you know, companies back and going. And, and those ran out as well. Uh, you know, not every company was able to get forward. And so they recently uh, got some new funding for that. I guess we'll see where that goes. But uh, yeah, you know, line of businesses that are also having a lot of difficulty accessing the aid from government after essentially being, you know, having their doors shut by government. Uh, sure. So you guys want to talk about any of those issues? Um, well, why you put me into a forum with this guy Leon, who's just uh, brilliant, everything he says, and uh, and I have to sound halfway intelligent around this guy. It's, it's <laughs> come on, man, come it's on. <laughs> um, but but my my biggest worry at this point is uh, the impact that that pumping at this point. Um, over 10% of 2019's GDP of brand new money into the economy. Uh, I, I have an issue with that. I believe that there are unintended consequences that will come along with that policy, um, similar to the unintended consequences of shutting down the economy in other ways. You know, so so I'm, I'm looking for at with with uh, wariness about what can happen with that much uh, and that's what i call brand new money it's um brand new uh, money injected for the most part into the financial markets and and now trying to trickle into small businesses and and people's pockets and the 1200 hundred dollar check and so on it's it, but it's all brand new money so what's going to happen you know some people say oh the you know, it'll be absorbed. Uh, there will be mass, uh, you know, significant inflation. Some people, you know, think that there may even be uh, a deflation because there's going to be deflation with shutting down the economy, which is true. Uh, and so uh, anyway, it's, it's just a lot of things that have occurred since the beginning of the year that, that I worry about besides the worry regarding the uh, virus itself. And that, that's all I have to say, I think. <laughs> well, there, there's no doubt there's going to be some real, some real impacts from, from, from this thing, you know, and, and, and Tim is absolutely right. This, this new money that they're pumping into the economy probably is going to be inflationary. Who knows? It might be deflationary too. I, I, I'm not sure. There are, so many, there are so many impacts here that we, 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 um, we probably experience because of this this COVID disease. But you know, this really comes back to one, one issue, okay? Whenever the government paints with one big brush, paints everybody with one big brush, they always get it wrong. And this is exactly what's gonna happen here. We, we, we shut down the economy, we're gonna pump all this money into the economy and do all these things, they're gonna get it wrong. And you know who's gonna pay for that? We, taxpayers. Well, I'm, I'm still a taxpayer even though I'm retired. That's, that's, that's who's gonna pay for it. And it always ends up this way whenever the government paints with one brush. They use their power in these ways. And this is one of the lasting effects that's going to happen from COVID, is that the government is stealing power from us as individuals, and they're going to keep some of it, and they're not going to give it back to us. And this is going to be the problem. This is, one of the, this is going to be one of the lasting effects of the COVID virus. Yeah, it's like that uh, one big, broad brush. Uh, you know, everybody gets a hat, and, uh, you know, you're 
Yeah, everybody will get one. You're free to like it, uh, but it's going to be red and it's going to be extra large. Yeah. <laughs> you, <know? laughs> you can, and you it's know, say it make Christmas America time great. or whatever. <laughs> there, oh, yeah. <laughs> hey, but, uh, you know, uh, the bottom line is it's always one size fits all, take it or leave it, you know, and, right. uh, you know, you're free to like it, but, you know, you're not mm. going to get any other choice. <laughs> so, uh, uh, plenty, but, you know, this. <laughs> Plenty of examples exist to uh, back that up. Yeah, uh, that yeah. whole broad brush uh, phenomenon. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, and in, in, in going counter to that, you know, is uh, uh, maybe our other uh, good news story, and that's the uh, uh, the Swedish response to this. And so, in Sweden, I'm not quite sure uh, that I haven't followed it for the last two days or so, but it's been pretty controversial over the last, you know, three or four weeks that Sweden had sort of bucked all the other countries in deciding that they were going to, you know, try to tell people to, you know, uh, exercise precaution, but we're going to leave it to you to figure out for the most part how you're going to deal with it. And, you know, we're going to leave the schools open. We're going to, uh, you know, we're going to recommend against people, uh, you know, getting together in crowds over 50 and such like that, but we're not going to sit there and just shut everything down the way. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So, and and at this point, Sweden made an announcement about uh, uh, I don't know four or five days ago that they believe by mid uh, May they were going to hit herd immunity levels of I don't know around sixty or seventy percent, something like that. So, right. I'm not yeah. sure if that's still standing, but that's what they were claiming around then. So, uh, you know, they hit those herd immunities, and essentially at that point, that's offering a lot of the protection that we need for those at-risk people in the community once you get to that level. Uh, so the virus just can't spread as well. Uh, that's essentially what herd immunity means for those who might not be out there is that the, the virus just has trouble transferring because uh -huh. people are, are immune. So do you, do you guys have any thoughts or want to expand a little on that Swedish uh, story? I mean, this really, to me, to me, the Swedish model is the model that we should have, uh, we should have um, uh, um, exercised here in the United States. You know, but you know, but really and truly, we don't have to go to Sweden to see this, you know. Right here in the United States, we had six states that did not shut down. South Dakota, the most prominent of them. And they, no one, not one, not a single one of them is reporting some massive amount of infections. I mean, there was one place in South Dakota, I believe, that was having some problems. There was some a meat processing plant or something like that. That was the only thing that they had. But the, the fact of the matter is, these things could be managed. These things will be managed, and Sweden, your Swedish example, is, is obviously proving that. We could have managed the infections without ruining the lives of our, our fellow fellow citizens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and a good example of that uh, broad brush issue is New York, even with the antibody testing we talked about earlier, their rates of, uh, of mortality were a little bit higher than the other rates uh, measured in Los Angeles and, and yeah. Santa Clara and uh, other big population centers. So, and it, it really shows that not every place has the exact same concerns. The uh, the disease is going to have a slightly different response depending yeah. upon the, the your demographic situation and you know how how stacked people are in those those living circumstances. So. The idea to just, you know, give some central edict and tell everybody to go with it, that seems right. really silly. But the, but, but, the thing, but the thing is that they just talk about demographics and, and people stacked against each other. But population density is an important thing here. And how, and how those people try to exercise any sort of mitigations within a dense population like in New York City or in Los Angeles is, 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 is critical. But if New York City became a hot, hot spot and we had to have more restrictions or you have to do something a little bit different, that's fine. Then New York would have to do that. That doesn't mean just because New York have to do that, it does not mean El Grove have to do the same thing because our population density is nowhere close to that of New York. Yeah. And, and, and so, not, yeah. yeah. Okay, go, go ahead, Tim. Well, we're, and we're not traveling in subways, to, you know, stacked in right. together real close. Sure. And so, you know, you know, for example, Los Angeles, everybody, tra most most people travel in cars. And so they're s segregated from people that uh, they normally uh, would not inter interact with in, in a close enough proximity to spread the disease. So so the, there you may have, um, you know, one example of, of, of one size fits all not being appropriate. Yeah. All right. So there you go. 
Sure. Yeah. And, and in a way, too, this is something it brings up that, you know, like you're saying that uh, uh, in a way we don't completely have a broad brush strategy in this country, even though everybody was sort of taking the, the you know, for the most part, the edicts from on high about lockdown. It was really the governor's responsibilities and not every governor chose to, to do that. So there's a few places, South Dakota, uh, and I think there were six other red states, I think, where the govern governors decided not to not the shot, yeah. full with full, full lockdowns. And so right. they and they haven't hit those levels like New York has hit. So it's mm -hmm. um, it'll be interesting to see how those things play out over time. Indeed, so, indeed, indeed. Yeah. This this brings up a, another tough issue for libertarians, though, and it's uh, we've talked about this a little before in the past on the show. I know, Leon, we were in a discussion on this in the past, but uh, vaccines, uh, you know, people are talking about vaccines being something that, uh, you know, might uh, might be coming within the next year, you know, it sure. may not be, but there's some optimism that we might get them this year. And if that's the case, should something like this be something that the government can just order a person to take? That's, uh, you know, for libertarians, this is definitely a, a, a sticky issue, whether we're using needles or not. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. What do you guys think on it? You know, you know, this is really a very interesting issue, this whole mandating vaccines, right? So here we have a problem. Do we have individual rights or does the government have the right to mandate such a thing against individuals now for the most part i will tend to say that our rights as individuals should be supreme at all times but this is a case where we have a serious externality that if we are not immune from the disease we can contract it and not only can we contract it we can spread it to someone else this is a serious externality on our individual rights. In that case, should we mandate? I would like to say no, but I cannot clearly say that, given the externalities that come from me contracting the COVID mm -hmm. virus or any other virus for that matter. I cannot clearly say no at this point in time. You're right, you use the correct word, Jason. It's a sticky issue. And I'm not sure that I right at this moment have the answer but it's something that we probably should think about a little more as to whether this should be mandated or not. I am not sure I'm ready to say that it should be, but I'm not saying I'm not saying it, it should not be either. Yeah, I, th I think I'm leaning toward the, uh, the more probably the libertarian answer, which, which might be, uh, again, we're not sure, but might be that, um, you know, my, my body is, I have dominion, over my body. In other words, I decide what goes into my body and what doesn't. And uh, from that standpoint, if a vaccine is so great and people don't want to get it, then they can have that injected into their body. And if I decide I don't want to because whatever, I'm thinking, you know, it, whatever I think, I just don't want to. Okay. So I'm I'm not going to be mandated to. I, I could be told and given a very uh, uh, convincing argument that it's a good idea to be vaccinated. And I can take that argument and decide one way or another as a free person. Um, and if I don't do it, then why am I a threat to somebody else? They, they just have to take the vaccine if it's, if it's so great right and, and and then boom they'll they'll be inoculated against my ability to give them the disease and in a non inoculated state and as you see what i'm saying so yeah. so um i think that it would be better to leave it up to the individual to decide if they get vaccinated or not and once again, you know, hey, if it's a convincing argument, I'll, I would probably willingly get vaccinated myself. So I'm not saying that I have anything against being vaccinated. And I would more than likely do it. But, you know, just for, if nothing else, just for my own safety. What it reminds me of is helmet laws and um, uh, safety belt laws. Um, 
okay, for my, you know, they kind of came along and they mandated those where uh, I, w- I wasn't a motorcyclist, but I was a, a driver and I always wore seatbelts well, well before they were mandated. And I insisted my kids wear seatbelts during the car. I didn't need a law with a, um, with a, uh, uh, a penalty for disobedience to, to tell me, hey, it's probably a good idea. I, I, I felt that my life and my safety was more important than saving a uh, hundred bucks on a fine. Yeah. Okay. Now that a lot of people had a different idea than I did. In other words, <laughs> they would reach down and pick up and put on the seatbelt and say to me, uh, Oh, I don't want to get a fine for not wearing a seatbelt. <laughs> so, and I would say back, you mean the, the risk of death wasn't enough of an, of a motivation for you. <laughs> so, so, uh, in this, in a similar fashion, the, you know, a, a, a vaccination to me again, to, to maintain the sovereignty we have over our own precious bodies, which is, should be motivation enough. If it's, if it's a good idea to be vaccinated, uh, but that, that sovereignty over our body should should take um, uh, precedence over anything else. Yeah, well, you know, it, and it's funny too because there are other methods. We don't necessarily have to use force to to get most people to go along. I, like you're saying, you can use a a story of just you know making the case to get people to voluntarily do it. But even beyond that. You can just use public pressure of, of your ability to discriminate against other people in a free society. Uh, there's no reason, it seems to me, that a barber couldn't have a sign up that said no shoes, no shirt, no vaccine card, no service. I, I don't understand why we can't look at a, a particularly a voluntary method. And if some people don't think it's a problem, you know, and then they can go to the establishment that says, you know, doesn't have that requirement for the vaccine card. But that seems to me to be a way where we could choose to just associate with people that we think are, you know, uh, giving themselves uh, uh, that measure of protection for both themselves and us by choosing the vaccine, I guess. Well, while, 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 you know, both, both, both you and uh, Jason, both you and Tim, I, 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 tend to agree with, I mean, since I'm libertarian leaning myself. But take, for instance, the public schools, mm-hmm. which is run yeah. by the government, OK? In nearly every state, every state in the union. What if they mandate that the child be vaccinated? Yeah. And you as a libertarian saying, well, that is my decision. But what if the government says, you cannot bring your child here unless you vaccinate the child? What then? And and this is the issue of one distortion begets another, you know, I mean, so the, the question should be, should we even have a public school system that's monopolized by the government or should we have well, a bunch of private well, that, schools? That, that's one of my, everybody that's one of my big, different, yeah. yeah, that's my one of my big peeves, right? But yeah. the situation yeah. is as it is that's right true. now. They run the schools. True. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Well, yeah, sure. Then, then uh, more homeschooling, and that'd probably be a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be good. give us a good natural experiment, you know. See how they're. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, we, you, know, yeah there, you know. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Well, you know, there, there was one other aspect of this before we wrap up this one that uh, we had the discussion before and uh, James was in on that conversation as well. And he brought up a pretty good point that uh, I think it's worth restating. And so, you know, sometimes, too, it, we're assuming that the information we're getting from the government is good information on on why we're doing what we're doing. And certainly this this whole uh, it, crisis has challenged us in that. I mean, you know, we were told early on, don't wear a mask by the government. <laughs> and, then, right. and then they came along and said, oh, wait, we, we changed our mind, wear masks. And then, 
you know, we were told that this is based, the pu public policy was based upon, you know, maybe a 5% death rate and then you know, maybe 3%, something like that. Either way, much larger than what they're finding out the actual death rate is. So, you know, either way, a lot of these decisions are being made. And what, what I find a little more disturbing in all this than even that is that recently we had a case of a couple doctors in California who decided to give their own opinion about this based upon the numbers they saw in their analysis of the public data. Uh, I can't remember the two doctors' names, but they've been showing Eric, quite Erickson. a bit. Oh, okay. Erickson was one guy. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And so, so these two doctors essentially came out saying, hey, look, this, you know, we're looking at the sampling and the mortality is pretty low. It's, you know, kind of similar to the flu in some respects. So, uh, you know, we really think that the current public policy now is is misguided and we should be you know uh, opening things up more that seemed to be the gist of what they were saying and the youtube uh it's funny it was it was actually done for a local news station but then it was replayed on youtube to millions and millions of hits and then youtube made the decision that well this contradicts the official who narrative world health organization and so therefore uh, we're going to decide to uh, um censor that and so they decided that they this would be banned from YouTube as content and so this really gets into the situation that when can we be competent in the information we're getting and this wasn't a specifically government action but it it is kind of getting into an interesting landscape where a lot of the narrative is being highly focused so that we can only hear one story you know these 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 big tech big tech companies um, they acting like the government, okay, which is problematic in my mind. But they are private; they are still private companies, and they, as far as I'm concerned, still have the right to decide what they want on their on their platforms and what they don't want. However, the story that was written about, at least the one that you sent to us, Jason, that link, even that story was so horribly biased, as unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, they started to talk. You were raising some of these issues about the death rates and all those other things and that kind of stuff. They were saying in that story, they used the word conspiracy theories to describe some of yeah. the work of these doctors, which was unbelievable to me. I mean, they did talk about how oh, somebody was pressuring somebody to call this a COVID death, blah, 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 and all sort of things and stuff like that. But the problem is with all of this is that if NBC, who I think was who, who reported on the story, had just taken a little bit of time to do a little bit of research, they would have seen that Dr. Deborah Bricks, who is on the COVID task force, even said that they were taking a more liberal view of who die of COVID, not who die with COVID, but who die of COVID, okay? So anybody, anybody who died with the virus in them is considered a COVID death. They didn't, it, does not whether, it doesn't matter whether they die because of, the, because of the virus or not. So there's no conspiracy theory here, but yet this is what was reported in the story that these doctors were taking these conspiracy theories and trying to make it news and, and all these other things. But this is the thing, this is the thing how misinformation becomes real becomes real. Is that we have first we have the doctors say one thing, we have the platforms take it off, and then everybody call these conspiracy theories misinformation that the public is not supposed to hear. I guess we are too stupid to make decisions on our own, is what they're trying to tell us. Mm. Uh my, I, I see this this kind of thing is uh, is not just in COVID. It's in so many other avenues where yes, uh, we have uh, things taken down. You know, for example, with YouTube, so on and so forth. And I, I'm still when, it, and in spite of all that, I'm still very happy that today we have so many options to get our information and granted we have to wade through a ton of stuff yes. where we didn't before and we have to we have to decide what is uh the truth and what is fiction whereas before we didn't have that problem we had the problem that we only got our news from abc nbc and cbs and then fox after that but prior to that, it was three sources, and we had newspapers that were controlled by by a single main source of, of news. So today, in spite of all these um, decisions being made by YouTube and, and other companies, uh, I am very much um, happy that that we have 
at least um, we we're we're not just limited to this this little tiny small sampling of people telling us what the truth is because right. I'm telling you the, the fewer sources of the truth you have I think the worse off you are at finding eventually finding the truth at least today you know we know about these guys from other sources you know and and the tr the truth eventually can't help but get out today with with the internet and our ability uh, you know even the three of us unknowns uh talking about it uh you know at least people can can have that well and then and, and uh <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, it's that three letter word war that constantly comes up, whether it comes up, you know, with response to actual war or with respect to a virus, which everybody now is analogizing to war. Suddenly everybody yeah. loses their sense of skepticality and coalesces around the government narrative. And, and yeah. then off we go uh, on our on our journey <laughs> to wherever it is. And, uh, you know, that's you know, that I, I think this is one of the things that's great about having this diversification of sources that, you know, you can actually hear information from other places. As you mentioned, it, it, it puts great deal of responsibility on the user to bet what they're hearing and try and make sure the source is good. But on the other hand, it keeps us all from just, you know, marching as zombies to whatever, you know, whatever end the, the planners have for us. <laughs> so, oh. yeah, because, because, uh, the, the saying, um, the truth is the first casualty of war. Yeah, uh, that is the, um, the the biggest parallel with COVID to a real war. War, perhaps, is the the truth was the first casualty in this war. If you want to call it a war, which I don't call it a war, but you know, I call it just a, a disease. You know, that's a, to me. And but apparently, the truth was the first victim of COVID nineteen. Yeah. Well, and then with that wisdom from on high from Tim up there, uh, we'll uh, wrap this show up and <laughs> our screaming eagle of freedom gets the final word. <laughs> so, and uh, so this has been a libertarian podcast of Libertarian Counterpoint. Um, you can, uh, this, this may wind up making it to the uh, uh, public access, but uh, it will, you can find it on the Libertarian Counterpoint Facebook page and uh, YouTube as well. Um, so please uh, check for back for more shows in the future. And uh, we uh, thank you for supporting Libertarian Counterpoint.